In today's video I talk about the nomenclature of disc herniations in the lumbar spine. So people use a wide variety of different terms when they are describing disc herniations and there are even institutionalized vocabularies like that are getting passed from generation to generation of radiologists and sometimes people don't use the same terms to describe the same thing. And there is a paper in 2014 by Farden et al. and you can see it right here on the screen that covers that and basically gives the proper definition for each of these terms. This video is more like a supplement to that paper and you also have a nice summary and nice illustrations regarding all these different definitions over on radiologyassistant.nl. So go check it out, you find the links to both of them in the description down below. Now let's jump right into it. The anatomy of the lumbar disc is quite simple. And we have here a standard MRI, a T2-weighted sequence in the sagittal and transverse plane. Now let me zoom in here quite a bit. And you can see we are here just at the level of this disc. So we have here the disc space between the end plates of these two vertebrae. And here in between this bright stuff is the nucleus pulposus. And it's surrounded by a strong annulus fibrosus. And why is it called an annulus, which is like a ring-like structure? You can see it here, because here we have the bright structure, which is the nucleus pulposus, and here the outer rim, the darker one, that's the annulus fibrosus. So this is a normal disc here. So the next thing that can happen to a disc is basically it gets dehydrated, a desiccation, and you can see this nicely here. So we have some normal discs here, and then the lower we go, the darker the signal gets on these two two-weighted sequences, meaning that we have less water content here. So we have a disc degeneration. And if we go back here to the L5S1 segment, then it's really a desiccated disc. The less water content we have, we start to see that the disc borders here are starting to come out of the disc space. So you probably know the permanent classification for the disc degeneration shown here in this image. Funny enough that working together with Professor Perman for about five years, we never really used this classification like at all. So interesting side fact here. And what we can see here that we have still some nucleus proposals with some water content because this is a little bit an older patient, um, not as young as the first one. And we have here the annulus fibrosus and you can see that the annulus fibrosus tissue is extending beyond the formally defined disc space. And this is also happening a little bit here. And a good way to see this is also the axial sequence. You can see here we have the upper border of the end plate here and if you go downwards you can see that this area is actually larger than it is here on the bone. So this is a sign that we have a symmetrical bulging disc or diffuse disc bulging sometimes called and it's important to realize that this is not a disc herniation by the new definition. Well it's not that new anymore but it's not a disc herniation because technically the disc material is still contained here within the annulus fibrosus and it's only the annulus fibrosus that is actually extending beyond the disc space. It can be symmetrical like in this case but it can also be asymmetrical if it's just bulging to one side or the other. And this brings us to the next topic which is an annular fissure and an annular fissure is basically a tear in the annulus fibrosus tissue. So we have here this annulus fibrosus tissue in, in black if we have a tear here, then we start to see some fluid-like signal intensity at this region here, just like this one here. And just to show you that we are dealing actually with a fluid here, this is a T2 fat saturated sequence here. You can also see them on your axials and they can have different orientations, but the most frequent one you will see is probably this orientation here at exactly this location. And it's an important distinction to not use the term analyst tear but rather another fissure because a tear somehow implies a traumatic origin and this can have consequences in the medical legal space so and it might translate into your own reporting language uh, in the same way it at least it does in German. I always report them even if they're small because they can actually be painful. This is a nice example of a disc extrusion on the level of L5S1 here. So first of all you can see that the annulus fibrosus here is torn or there is a defect and we have 
disk material from the nucleus pulposus going through here and then here exiting the disk space and we have this large disk herniation and because this distance here is wider than the base it's actually a disk extrusion and you can nicely see this here if this was would just be like this here and the same here on this image then we could call it a disk protrusion and this is also nicely seen here you can see here this disc is quite okay we have still the nucleus pulposus here intact and enough uh, fluid content and then we have the annulus fibrosus and if you go down here and you window a little bit you can start to see that this annulus fibrosus starts here uh, tearing apart if we go a little bit more laterally you can see that it's still intact but here we have a defect and we might actually have a beginning of a disc herniation here at this level. The next thing that can happen is basically a migration of disc material which is a displacement of this material away from the initial site of extrusion here. So basically we have here this disc material that is migrating a little bit downwards here and it is still in contact with the initial disc extrusion here. However, some surgeons already use the term sequestration or sequester for this kind of a disc herniation because interoperatively it's basically not connected anymore. So they can just pick it out and it's not adherent here to this rest of the disc herniation. Keep in mind that these disc migrations can happen into the posterior epidural space and I've seen several cases myself but I'm showing you here a case report and you can see here we have this disc or this mass here in the posterior spinal canal with uh, still some contact here to the rest of the disc so there was a disc herniation that then migrated into the posterior epidural space and don't confuse that with uh, some kind of a tumor and have this posterior mi migration as a differential diagnosis if you see any uh, strange masses here in the spinal canal at the level of the disc. At this point I have to welcome two new patrons. Uh, first of all Tim. Thank you Tim for joining my Patreon campaign. Your support is very well appreciated and also Double Dubs who joined me a few days ago. So thanks guys and if you want to become a patron yourself go check the link in the description down below. Now this is a nice example for a proper sequestration of a disc hernia and you can see here the disc we have this fissure in the annulus fibrosus and then if you follow it through here tuck, tuck, we can see that we have some disc material here outside of the disc space so we have this disc material here and we cannot really see a connection anymore to this um, rest of this disc up here and this annulus fibrosus fibers here. So that would be a true sequestration. To describe the direction of the disc herniation on the axials there are a few different terms and they are also in the paper. I would suggest that you go and have a look at it. So basically they differentiate between the central canal zone here which is like a central disc herniation. Then you have the subarticular zone, which is a little bit more to the lateral side on both sides, but not yet foraminal. So um, they refer to this as the subarticular zone, paracentral or paramedian. And then we have the foraminal disc herniations. So basically a disc herniation, which is just here at this level. And then you can also have extra foraminal um, disc herniations which are often missed and um, yeah the most frequent ones you have is just like here in the subarticular zone because frequently the posterior longitudinal ligament is quite a strong structure that prevents the hernia to be completely central here so this is just as uh, from this paper you can see the nomenclature here uh, go check it out the paper is freely available um, I have the link down in the description and um, these are the different zones and if you go even a third down here you can see that they are also making this distinction in the sagittal and coron coronal projections regarding the orientation of the disc herniation but it's probably fine if you just say that it's uh, migrating uh, upwards or downwards and then if you want you can use this term but I typically don't use them. 
please let me know in the comments below whether you are using these terms or whether you have your own terminology that you use while you are reporting MR of the lumbar spine. And that's it for this week folks and see you next week.